We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Tonight, we've got a perfect start of the new year question. Phil Hatfield, longtime fan of the show, contacted us on MeWe to say, Okay, Mo, here is a question for you. My local library is running some game nights in my area. I attended the one, I attended the one in September, December, and they have three more planned, one for January, one for February, and one in March. They mostly had games like Scategories, Monopoly, and other mass market style games that you can pick up at your local stores like Target and such. They had a couple of hobby games like Sushi Go Party, Timeline, and one or two others. Needless to say, I have a bit more exposure to games than the group running the event seems to have. I thought about bringing in some simple light games to see if more people would be interested in newer games instead of the same selection I saw there in December. I was thinking of games like Suro, Camel Up, perhaps Love Letter, but I don't know if I would be stepping on toes since this is obviously library people who are hosting and running the event. If you have suggestions for how to broach the subject with them about demoing new games without sounding like a know-it-all. <laughs> and if I can convince them, what games would you suggest to run for a mixed group of people who likely have no concept of hobby games? Well, first off, I want to start by saying I wouldn't really call those games that Phil called hobby games. To me, those are educational games. Those are the kind of games you find at like Scholar's Choice, and I'm sure there's other educational toy stores out there. Um, to me, like I, I don't even like that doesn't even think Catan. Like you can get those. Those are those are mostly quick party games that people like to use in schools. Now, what Phil is describing here, I've got to say, is pretty common occurrence from what I've seen. Um, both locally, when Somewhere News sets up a new game night and I go out expecting all the local gamers to be there, and often a bunch of us local hobby gamers show up and are like, oh, okay, so you have Mario Yahtzee and you've got Cards Against Humanity. Um, all right, then. <laughs> um, it, it's, a, it's a common thing, and I see people complaining about this all the time, um, board game geeks, uh, forums on Board Game Geek Facebook, the Dice Tower Facebook, pretty much anywhere where a bunch of hobby gamers have gathered. Someone has complained about going out to a local gaming event and not finding what they were hoping to find. It makes sense, though, because board games are all over the media right now, and probably for the last three years. And lots of people are hopping on the public play bandwagon. Now, this includes libraries, but also schools, clubs, organizations like the local legions, cafes, coffee shops. Everyone's like, oh, board games are popular. That's how we'll get more people in. Let's have a board game night. Now, all of these people launching these events have great intentions, but many, like the organizers of Phil's local event, don't really have a lot, if any, idea of how the board game industry and board gaming has changed over the years. And I'm totally with Phil here. It can be a shame and rather frustrating to show up to one of these events and just see, I'll, I'll say it, some terrible games, like mass market favorites and and like, like they expect Monopoly to be a good game, but it's a two-hour game night. Like you just see a lot of disconnect from what these people expect the event to be and what they're offering to make that event what it is. Well, yes. And, and unfortunately, a lot of people aren't exposed to the other side of gaming. They go to Target, they go to Walmart, they go on Amazon, and they see the mass market games. They may have never even figured out what that strange board and card game store over there is that the, the magic people go to. Uh, mm -hmm. They may have never walked in there and learned that there is this whole other world of board games out there. Uh, so that's why they should listen to our podcast at... <laughs> there you go. That's what we're here for. <laughs> but now, unfortunately, there's a huge chunk of missing information here. I think getting that information is key to any and all steps that are going to follow for Phil. So who's running it and why are they running it? Yeah, so so the first part of Phil's question, right? How do how do I breach the subject, breach the subject without without sounding like a, a know-it-all, right? I'm, I'm gonna use the proper term here, but without, without being a dink about it, right? So the first thing you're gonna want to do is find out who is running the event. And you're gonna wanna approach them and offer to help and try to do it without offending anyone or again feeling coming off as superior or condescending. So first you do need to know who's in charge. Now, Phil's particular case here, it sounds like it might be a group of people, 
Uh, it doesn't sound like there's one organizer, which I've got to say, unless there's a ton of people, I'm kind of surprised they have multiple people at a de library dedicated to this. But that might just show how much buy-in they actually have. So you're going to want to find out who's in charge. And you're going to want to talk to them. Now, my first tip here for Phil and anyone else who's in the same situation is don't do this in public. Don't call someone out at the event when there's lots of gamers standing around and lots of people playing games. You want to do this in private somehow. You don't want the person to feel embarrassed or pressured by you calling them out. You don't want this to be a call out. You want this to be a conversation about how can we improve this night. Now, the good thing is, it, since it's a library, there's probably a directory of staff. So if you can mm -hmm. find out who it is, you may be able to just email them and really keep yes. this in the background and not risk any sort of public thing. But check and then recheck your wording. So much nuance is lost in tech text you want to be offering help and guidance not in any way complaining about what they're doing because you you enjoy the fact that they're yes. they are are running a board game night you're just concerned and or or interested in helping them uh, broaden their audience and uh, selection yeah personally this is one like yes i i get it a lot of us um are a little antisocial at times and i get wanting to email but this i really do think is a better conversation to have in person what I would probably do is go to the next gaming event and try to do it at the start, possibly show up a little early or at the end of the next gaming event, because added to that, you could have the stuff I'm going to suggest on hand. So if they do say yes, you could immediately act on it without, I'm sure people know where we're going, but if we're going to say, Hey, can you let me try out some new games with the group and you have them with you, you could be like, you know what? I've got some games in the car. I could bring them in. What do you think? I just think it's going to go over better because the biggest problem is uh, it, Facebook, social media, Twitter is a perfect example of going and going, hey, I think I can bring better games than you have. And the person taking that as, what, you mean my games are garbage? And, and you don't want to get to that point. You don't want it to be adversarial or confrontational. Now, in this conversation, you're going to want to let them know who you are, right? Hey, I'm Phil Hatfield. I'm a longtime gamer. I've been into hobby games for years, blah, blah, blah. Just a bit of background. And I came out to your event and I had a good time, but I was just wondering if you'd be interested in doing some things a little bit differently because that game night was great. I don't want you to change a thing, but I would like to add to it. So again, Sean mentioned this earlier, and I think it's, it's key is don't tell them their event is bad. Like you don't want to come off as your event sucks. I'm here to fix it. No, you're not here to fix it. You're here to make things better. Point out the advantages of making things better. The advantages of more modern games. There's some things people don't realize about modern hobby gaming that goes way beyond interesting new mechanics. Things like most modern games have a time limit that is pretty accurate. Now, I don't necessarily say go with what it says on the box because we all know that can be off, but Board Game Geek's a great place to find proper times. But if you're showing off games, you tend to know your time limits. You know how long games last. One of the biggest problems with a lot of mass market games is they don't have a definitive end or their end can get extended. You sit down to play a game of Monopoly and I'm probably going to pick on Monopoly a lot tonight, though that's not necessarily intentional. How long is that going to take? You don't know. It is very much based on the luck of the dice and how players play and whether you use the full rules or not. Yeah, Monopoly, Whereas, Monopoly especially being the one yeah. where just trying to get a group of people to agree on a rule set for Monopoly uh is probably a uh quest on its own very true so knowing that i can finish a game of goku in 15 minutes i can play a game of chocolatiers in under an hour and i can play a game a, a, a game of castles of burgundy in an hour and a half to two hours with longer players you can better pick games that fit the game night and schedule them even a game of yahtzee you never know how long that's going to take because of the random rolls Whereas most modern hobby games have very distinct time limits that are usually based on the number of people playing. You're probably not going to have a time, time to get even 4th edition Twilight Imperium in the, the library. No, unlikely, unless it's some kind of marathon gaming night. But know that, right? You can find the information. You can find out that Twilight Imperium takes 6 to 16 hours or whatever it happens to be for the new edition. Other advantages are higher player counts. Most mass market games play a family of four. They're designed for your standard family of four. And you're kind of stuck with that without playing two copies. Yes, there are examples that go bigger than that. And while, yes, you can technically play Uno with 12, it's actually designed for four and actually does work a little better with lower player counts. 
So higher player counts are often available. You've got stuff like Sushi Go, which was actually already there, but that plays a high player count. There, there are lots of games that play tons of players, including throwing in like a werewolf or mafia that can play a group of any size. I personally think most modern games are more engaging than old school games because everyone is invested because of the strategy and tactics in them. So more people are going to be more engaged because you don't even care what you're doing. You care what your opponents are doing. When you're playing many mass market games, it's almost multiplayer solitaire. It's whoever can roll the farthest, whoever can get the furthest, whoever can get the hand of cards. I don't really care what you're doing on your turn. Just get back to my turn so I can roll the dice and move. Or you worse, don't get that as much. skip a turn, which is just... Yes unfortunate for everyone uh things like player agency actual control over the game where your decisions make a difference that is huge that is what draws most people to hobby board gaming keeps us all coming back for more and more the feeling that you did something you made a difference and then when you win there's an actual sense of accomplishment or the feeling that you built something or you went on a journey looking at various different types of games when you get to the end of a game of uh snakes and ladders what'd you do to win what was your winning strategy right it just doesn't exist and yes some that that's probably an extreme example but a lot of the mass market card game or board games and card games are like that i had the best shuffle in candy land ever that's exactly um educational a lot of these games are a lot more educational and cover topics that mass market games don't if you are a library and it happens to be Black History Month, bringing in a copy of Freedom the Underground Railroad is an awesome way to provoke, prevent, uh, promote the month to better get people talking about topics that are easily avoided and to get gamers in. And like it just, it, it's a win win in a way, especially at a library. And that can expand to anything. There's, a, there's probably a board game for pretty much every historical period. But also, once you get into literature, there are Arthur card board games like Shadows Over Camelot. There are, <laughs> there's millions of topics. I'm not going to stop trying to call out specific ones off the top of my head, but you can probably tie your game night to the library way better with a hobby board game night than a mass market game night. Also, some of the mass market ones are terrible. <laughs> You might want to have a Winnie the Pooh board game night, seeing as he went into the public domain, you're not going to have much luck there. Yeah, I th although I have to say, I, I feel like I had a Winnie the Pooh board game growing up. I vaguely remember. I, there has to be a spinner based, probably Disney branded. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure it was Disney's Pooh. I'm sure it wasn't yeah. uh, Milne's. But uh, yeah. So the other thing that having these games out is, is to me, they're better games, right? You're going to get people are going to come out, play these and want to discover more. So they're going to come back for more. You're also going to get different people coming out. When you have a public play event, you have games like Monopoly and Scrabble and Scategories, you are going to get casual gamers who like just want something fun to do for the evening. Whereas you start bringing out their Catans and get up to levels like Power Grid, you're going to start getting hobby gamers out that are there to play the games, not just to socialize. So you're actually attracting a different audience. And you're also bringing in people who are passionate about games. So you don't just have a bunch of people sitting around. You have people in there who are engaged, energized, and having fun, which is just going to make the game and the events more interesting for everyone else there, right? It's just the energy in the room. If you walk into a, a room where a bunch of people are playing Euchre, like a Euchre tournament, versus you walk into a hobby game night that was packed, like one of our Extra Life events, the vibe is very different. You do want to be careful, though. And again, this goes to not trying to uh, overwhelm them or, or indicate that they're bad. There is a reason to have market, mass market games yes. there. Uh, mm -hmm. Having mass market games there allows the people who aren't hobby gamers to feel a level of comfort when they walk mm. in. Someone who's not a, a, a gamer, a hobby gamer, uh, can walk into a room and see people playing Catan or you know Galaxy Trucker or um, you know any of this these these strange games and get overwhelmed easily. Mm -hmm. But if they see a box of Monopoly sitting there, even if it's not being played, seeing some games that they know and understand and are mm -hmm. familiar with can really comfort them. And maybe they'll sit down and play some some categories and then you can someone can talk them into another game. Hey, you want to come join us over at this game here? You know, you want to come play Go Cuckoo? Sure. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and ease them into the other scary games that they aren't used to. <laughs> 
and this kind of goes with what I said earlier about how you want to build on the existing event. You don't want to replace. You're not here to fix. Mass market games are mass market games and sold in the biggest stores in the world for a reason. They are popular. People do enjoy them, and I'm not saying they're terrible, except maybe Monopoly. I might be saying that just a bit. Terrible for a public play event either way. You don't, you don't want to rip off the person you've never met before in a bad deal and have them lose and be mad at you when you don't even know them. Not a game you want to play in public for many reasons. But overall, yes, have the mass market fair. Always have decks of cards. That is probably my number one. Have decks of cards. There are so many different games you can play with decks of cards. Now, maybe as the hobby gamer, you might want to show people some interesting new ways to play with decks of cards. But have decks of cards. Decks of cards are fantastic. Have roll and moves. Have, have sorry, troubles, um, snakes and ladders for younger kids. Though I can't see any adults playing it. Have those kind of games people are used to because it's going to make them comfortable. And even then, don't pressure people to try the new ones. If they're happy playing that, let them be happy playing that. Yep, absolutely. Now, another thing to suggest for Phil is to make sure that you can show how you can help. Like, not just, hey, your game night sucks, fix it, right? That's not what you want to do. And I already say, you don't want to say your game night sucks. But even like, you know what would be great if you had some more hobby games? I think that would make the game more entertaining for everyone. Thank you. I really hope you have some next week, right? That doesn't help. You want to be able to show how you can help. For one, and I think most hobby gamers can pull this one off, you know what, next week, next time, next month, let me bring in some games that I think your group will enjoy. Stuff that's just a little more complicated than what you have here that I think is more engaging. Stuff that'll keep players more interested. Or let me show, blow your mind by bringing in this game that's like reverse pickup sticks that you have no idea how engaging it can be until you play it, right? Offer to do that. Be sure to offer to teach these games. Um, tell them what you can do for them, right? Like, please use my skills. I am here to try to make your event better. What can I do to help? That's an important question to ask. They put the suggestion out there, but also ask, what can I do to help? Absolutely. And the other option is there are other games out there that are technically mass market, but more gamer games. You can get mm -hmm. into variations of Parcheesi or Nine Men's Morris mm -hmm. and, and other games that, hey, you know what? This game is actually just like Sorry, but you know yes. this has been around for ages. There's a, there's a bunch of different ways to uh, to sort of broach things and 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 sh again shift people, uh, ease them into the bigger world of games. So what I would suggest too is starting small, like keep the format right. Whatever format they have set up, don't change it for next month, right? Whatever that happens to be, whether it's everyone shows up and they sign in and there's a list of games to play, whatever whatever that happens to be, stick to what they have and then, again, build on it. You don't want to necessarily change it. If it changes over time, sure, maybe that's good, maybe that's bad. But don't go in expecting to fix everything. Maybe bring in one new game, right? Like a, a well-known gateway game, like stuff that people may have heard of, like Catan's all over the news. I think pretty much everyone's heard of Ticket to Ride. Something approachable, but still a step above what most people grew up with. Offer to teach it during the show if enough people get interested. Or maybe go with something flashy, right? So it's simple and simple to learn that is totally going to blow people's minds. A great game for that for me is Ice Cool. You now have a game about flicking penguins or bring in a copy of Crokinole or Pitch Car, something that's just so different from what people are expecting when they show up to play a board game night. They think a board game means roll dice and move on a track. That's what most people think. As, as going to com comic cons and trying to show off hobby board games, it still seems like the majority of people think that it's either trivia, a party game where you have to draw or guess something, or you roll and move dice, roll and move upon. That's what most people have in their heads. When they show up and see a race car track where you're flicking little wooden discs, it just kind of blows their minds. Absolutely. And there's so many options out there that, you know, even just uh, a simple game um, like uh, DC Legends or uh, Legends of Marvel Legends or DC Heroes, you know, games that are board games, but completely break that uh, mold that people have in their minds of mm -hmm. roll and move around the square. Now, another thing I would do to help show that you are adding value to their night is offer to promote the event to other hobby gamers, right? Because if you have these kind of games, so right, right, if you add some more strategic games, I know I can get the, the people who hang out at Hugan and Muna, our local game store, 
they're, they have an open game night on Wednesday. I bet you I can get half those people to come out here on a Friday just because I know they're into these kind of games. and They're always looking for new places to play their games. Be able to sell the fact that you're going to help them grow their event, not just with different games, but with different people. Now, do, however, be careful with promotion. It's easy to unbalance supply and demand. You don't want to suddenly get all of the hobby gamers from the local game store piling in one night when you're just bringing in maybe a couple of your games to get things started. Mm -hmm. Everyone gets bored and no one comes back. Yeah, very true. Uh, this goes to something else. Like This is more running a game night, public play game night, which I didn't really get into a, a lot. I don't really want to get into a lot tonight. But you don't want to scare people away. And again, don't force people. Uh, this is one of the things. There's an awesome interview with the owner of Snakes of Lattes who said when they first opened the store, it was Hobby Games and like the Monopoly Sorry Go show. Now it's Monopoly, Sorry, Go, and Hobby Games, because that's what people want when they come to the store. And when you're running a business, you have to give people what they want. Said 90% of the people who walk in didn't plan to sit down and play games and think all night. They were, happened to be wandering by or like, oh, let's go play a couple board games, have a coffee and a snack. And those kind of games are where your mass market games fall in. And you don't want to try to pressure people. Now, what you do say is maybe have a section say, if you like this, you might like this or something like that you might want to have. But in general, you don't want to pressure anyone or to make them feel insignificant, stupid or inferior for liking different types of games. Games are games. It's a hobby. It's meant to be something fun. If that's what they find fun, all the power to them. And it may be just a matter of you bring in a game you want to play. And maybe a couple of people get interested and you play your fun ga a hobby game together and people are interested. Uh, yep. And maybe next week you bring a different game and they ask, oh, what about that other game you had last week? I saw you guys playing that and it looked fun. Mm -hmm. You bring that again next week. That may be all it takes. Uh, of course, you do want to make sure that you are able to bring games in. They, don't, yeah. they, may, uh, <laughs> they may have rules about that. But if you are and if they're okay with you bringing your own games in, it may just be a matter of, January, you bring in fun game, you know, careful yours to, to play and, and, and play with people. And a couple of people see you, watch you and ask questions as you're playing with one or two other people that were interested enough to sit down with you. And then the next month, you know, you bring another game and people start asking and that just slowly builds interest mm -hmm. or it doesn't. And that's fine too. But yes. it's the, definitely the easier way to sort of slow grow uh, people and, and feel out people's interest in the hobby yeah to me that's that's the easier way to do it to me it's a bit of a passive aggressive way though kind of like just show up with new games like i don't like what you have so i'm bringing my own games i'm going to set them up and start asking <laughs> people to play like personally i think you should still talk to the organizers and make sure it's okay like sean said ask if you can bring games but depending on your personality type and what the you know phil's been to the event he knows the vibe of the place you might be able to judge from that vibe that, you know what, maybe these people aren't that approachable and this is one way to do it. Like I said, a little more passive aggressively, like, hey, I don't like the games you have, so I'm going to bring my own in. One of the things I do suggest, though, is if you are going to do this, bring in another hobby gamer with you, whether that's one or two people, and play these games with them. This way you can sit down and start playing and other people can see you enjoying the game, right? And anytime we have done this at a public play event that tends to have... Um, non-gamers present right especially if we play in a public space where we're like in a corner but the rest of the place is still doing its own thing we always get people come over and go what are you playing what's that and yes they're gonna say is it like monopoly because that's what they say because that's what they know and they're looking for a basis of comparison you want to do that so that then when people do want to over you're like oh no this is this and you know we're about done we're gonna start another round do you want to play and that's where i recommend you bring a couple people like like leave room for people to join so i probably wouldn't start with terraforming mars and and that might be a march game to me that that's a bit overwhelming with all the cards on the table and the hexes there's just so much going on but if you do bring in say a ticket to ride or a Catan or a gizmos or something kind of next step level games start a two-player game of gizmos and when that ball marble drop starts happening and people come over say hey you want to join in you know what we just started it's easy for us to restart what you don't want to do, and I've actually seen this at local play events, and I had to ask the person doing it, is why are you showing up? Is 
don't show up with six people with a six player game and set it up in a corner and play your six player game and don't interact with anyone else in league. Like to me, I've never understood. I'm like, why don't you just play at home? Now I will admit with that group, no one had a home with the table big enough. So they were coming out to the public play event to use the table. But personally at a public play event, I want to encourage people to interact. So I wouldn't be that person to take up a corner and just do my own thing. What you would want to do is to try to, again, you're trying to improve the event for everyone, not just for you. Now, when picking games, you might want to also catch people's attention right away. So what I try to do, and this is what I did at our easy mode events, which was a new venue that got in a very different type of person than our local game store did. Most of the people coming in there were video gamers who were curious about board games. So what I would do is get the games set up. And what I would do here is I would actually try to do it before people show up. So again, if you've talked to the, the organizer, say, hey, can I show up 10 minutes early, five minutes early to get some games set up? You want them games set up on the table, ready to play and looking interesting. With that, maybe have a little placard or something that says, this is uh, Dead Man's Cabal a game about necromancers trying to form a dance party. And then maybe have another sign that says, if you like Catan, come check out um, Chinatown, a great game about trading resources or something like that to get people interested. Now, the disadvantage of having multiple games set up is you might need to teach multiple games, but it's a way to get people interested. Plus by having these signs out, it makes them approachable. People aren't like, oh, that's a display. Or, oh, that's Phil's game. He's sitting in the corner and he's going to play with Phil's friends. By doing this, it's inviting people to check out the games and try them. Absolutely. Now, one of the things you might want to do, uh, this is specific to Phil, but anyone else in the situation is actually offered to take over. Now, game nights are a lot of work, but can be so worth it. Now, this of all options is the most pretentious, right? Like you're only going to do this if the person running the event doesn't look like they want to be running the event, or you can tell they're struggling, they're not having fun. Perhaps the library was like, hey, Bob, you're running our monthly board game night now. And Bob's like, well, board games? I don't play board games. You could volunteer to take over Bob's place. But don't do it in a, hey, Bob, you're doing a terrible job at this. I think I could do better, right? Again, you got to be tactful about this. Absolutely. You need, and you do need to be careful, uh, more than likely, since it is at a library, regardless of who's running it, there has to be a library person in charge just to be right. able to use the space. So there are, there are definitely uh, liability and insurance aspects to that as well. Okay, um, I'll just jump ahead. Sorry. Uh, yeah, so there again, uh, well, you covered a lot of this, though, so I don't want to uh, okay. sort of double, double down on things. So one, one, way of, one way you can definitely do this, though, is if the person is interested in running the game, maybe Bob really does like board games, build them some board games that they seem to not be aware of. Uh, hmm. Maybe they only know Monopoly and Scategories and, and Sushi Go. Uh, and maybe if you introduce them, maybe, you know, talk to Bob and go out for coffee one night and invite him somewhere else to play board games and introduce him to Catan or something like that. And they'll be hooked and they'll be the ones who are trying to introduce that stuff to there. Uh, it, it's certainly, you know, don't necessarily make it about that game night, make it about introducing Bob or whomever to these new games uh, and mm -hmm. let them introduce them to the game night. So that's what I've got for, for tips for at least breaching the subject and how you can approach it, what you can offer. And again, the, the, the key point here is you're not there to fix anything. It's not necessarily broken. You are just looking to add to an existing night to make it appeal to more people like yourselves. So approach it that way, right? Approach it as trying to improve something that exists to make it better for everyone. Absolutely. Now, as for the second part of this, Phil's part of it was what are some great games to bring to such events? So this is something we've definitely covered before. So what I want to do is give you a little list of stuff, places you can go with it in our content to learn about this, because this is not the first time this type of questions come up, though in this particular aspect of a, a public play event without, with games that Phil didn't like is definitely new. But as for talking about gateway games, games to hook gamers and so on, we've already got a lot of content out there. So 
episode 28 going way back was called the hook that was games for catching new gamers and every game on that list i went through it today just to confirm i still recommend we talked about next step games from Catan in episode 42 life the universe and more than Catan. so if you have Catan friends fans and they know it what i did is break it down into the different things about Catan people could like like rolling for resources or trading and i talk about once we even specifically talked about follow-up games to Ticket to Ride. So if, again, you know, the group there has played Ticket to Ride, we covered that on Working on the Railroad, which was episode 132. Um, episode 54 was the last time we totally revisited Gateway Games. We called Gateway Games the Next Generation, where I recommended a bunch of games that were currently in print and had been printed in the last three years, back when that episode came out. Due to the age of all that, though, I did think it'd be worth revisiting it tonight with a new list that includes some more modern games than are on those older lists. Which is shocking for us, I know, but we'll <laughs> get to some new stuff. So first off, I'm going to start with the ones Phil mentioned, because I think they're legit. I think they're really solid. So this isn't going to help Phil out at all, but for those of the rest of you out there, don't mention Camel Up. Camel Up. Uh, this is a great betting game that looks like a racing game. Now, the mechanics are simple enough that you're going to be able to teach pretty much everyone. I know kids that play this game. It's really simple. Take an action. You can do this, or you can do this, or you can move the camels. That's it. Now, where this is going to blow away most non-gamers' minds is the fact that you don't have a player piece. That is a difficult concept for some non-gamers. <laughs> you don't own any of the camels. The camels are going to race around the track on their own, but I rolled dice to move the camel. Yes, you can choose to move one of the camels, and it will move, but that's not your camel. What you do control is you are betting on those camels. What camel do you think is going to come in first? What camel do you think is going to come in last? As well as making bets on who's going to be ahead each round. This is a great choice for a game that is both going to be familiar. It's a race. It's a bunch of camels going around an oval. And has new concepts that players probably aren't used to. Yeah, no, absolutely. Camel Up is, uh, is, is right out up there with uh, introductory games. Now, Sturro, I'm not a huge fan. I actually talked about this earlier in the podcast tonight. But this can be a fantastic game for new gamers. This teaches the absolute basics of tile laying. Every tile in Sturro fits with every other tile in Sturro. You don't have to worry about matching sides. They all match. What you got to watch is where the um, paths go. I, the whole idea of having three tiles in your hand and playing one and drawing new tiles is a mechanic used in many other hobby board games. So this is a great step. If you have a non-hobby gamer and you're thinking of teaching them Carcassonne, often considered a great gateway game, you might want to just start with Suro to get the basics of putting tiles out and that infecting the board every turn. Suro also plays a huge number of players, which can be great for getting people to interact with other people they may not know in person, at least not yet. Absolutely. And that is part of this. Again, we want more people interested in these games if you want them to continue trying out these new strange games. And uh, interaction is the key to that. Now, Love Letter is the last one he mentioned. Now, this is one I personally don't love, but it has proven to be hugely popular with gaming groups of all ages and experience levels. The key here, though, as far as I can tell, is having someone who knows the game well at the table to teach it and then to monitor it. While I can set up Suro and teach it in five minutes, you place a tile, this happens, and then just walk away, you're going to want to sit and watch the first early games of Love Letter to make sure everyone has the rules down. Especially for a non-gamer, the concept of having drawing one card and then discarding and being able to peek at other people's cards and not talk about it. For an 18-card game, there's actually a lot of little intricacies that most people take for granted. As a hobby gamer, you're like, yeah, it's a social deduction game. I get it. But if you've never played these kind of games, what I would start off with is go, this is somewhat like Clue, because Clue is probably the one mass market deduction game people know of. Absolutely. And the one thing you need to really pay attention to here is that you're going to be the one who's almost certainly teaching anything mm -hmm. you bring and not just once. So be prepared on that front. If you're bringing multiple games, uh, if you're deep in the middle of for the queen uh, and someone wants to play Suro, who's never played it before. And the other people have only played it once and aren't sure they're, you're going to, they're going to need you as the teacher 
as the person who brought those games to get in there and help. And we've talked uh, we've talked before on other episodes about how organizers don't always get to play. Yeah, what I would recommend here is in Phil's case, I know Phil wants to play. So Phil's best bet is to offer to demo the game Phil wants to play. And that is the only game Phil will be demoing. And the organizers are in charge of everything else going around around them is probably your best bet. Because when you're only, they only scheduled, right? They had an event in December. They only have three more scheduled. That's not a lot of time to do it. So unless Phil's like wants to throw out one of those months just to teach people various hobby games. Though I still say the secret here is get other hobby gamers out because hobby gamers love to share their hobby. And no, not everyone can teach, but everyone loves to introduce new people to their favorite game. Yep, absolutely. Well, now on to some games we suggest for getting people at a public play event playing more complicated games. All right, as usual, this list is in no particular order other than these are the order they kind of came into my brain when I was writing kind of on the show notes. The number one game I have, I shouldn't even call it number one, the first game I have is Fun Fair. This is a card-driven game where you're building a theme park. Now, most people are going to be familiar with card games in general, right? Shuffling, having a hand of cards, drawing cards, and playing cards are pretty common concepts. What you do have to watch for here is getting across the importance of building an engine. The thing is, Funfair is fantastic for it because of how well your engine building ties to the theme. You are going to build a roller coaster. You're going to add a loop-de-loop -loop to it. You're going to add a big drop to it. And you're going to add comfortable seats. And you're going to have a washroom in the line. That all makes sense to the average person who's been to a theme park before. Oh, you're going to add a greeter at the door? That gets you more money. Oh, you've got someone who's cosplaying the costume character? That's going to get you more money. Because of how well the theme is tied to the game, I think Funfair is a fantastic starter engine builder card game. Absolutely. It is a great game for introducing hobby games and hobby card games as both cards and theme parks are pretty universal yes. concepts. And that just helps this game get learned that much faster. Now, the next one is a game on our list. We used to talk about it felt like on a daily basis, even though we are a weekly show, and that is Azul. I, in this particular case, I am talking about the original game, the base game. This is a now classic abstract strategy game all about drafting beautiful looking tiles and placing them onto your player board to match an existing pattern. Now, scoring in Azul is the one stumbling point I can see with new gamers, and I've actually had that problem with hobby gamers. If anyone at the table has played Scrabble, though, they should pick up on it right away because the scoring system is actually very similar, except for the bonus point. Now, the other versions of Azul are also worth considering. But personally, I think the basic game is the most approachable of the three Sur or Azul games. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Stick with the basic and maybe have some scoring examples even printed out. Just, mm. just to help reference, to have someone look for. I know they're there on the bottom of the board, but those are not as clear as they mm. could be. Next, I have the silliest game on the list, which is Go Cuckoo. A game from Haba released for Easter. This is, yes, this is a kid's game. This is meant for small children, but this is a great game to show off to adults that not all board games have to involve a board and rolling dice or trivia. This is a game all about pulling out um, sticks and building a bird nest and then trying to place eggs into that nest so they balance. This game has great table presence, which is going to get people going, what are you doing? I have never set up a game of Go Cuckoo that didn't turn heads unless everyone in the room had seen the game played before. And almost everyone who walks over is like, can I play this next? It is such a great game. It is a fantastic kids game that I have had so much fun with, with players of all ages. Absolutely. This one is a great one to slip in based on games they're already playing. They won't even realize they've moved to something that's more advanced as they're just having so much fun. We have even yep. set this up in a back corner behind a streaming table on a chair for yes. two of us to play quietly and still manage to get other people jumping in to play the game. Uh, thanks for the follow, new new 1000. And we will be getting to the comments. Our chat room is, is slowly filling in with game recommendations. We'll get to those shortly after we finish off our list, which we don't have much left. Next up, I've got King Domino. Now, most people, 
uh, dominoes, at least when I was growing up, I, I actually wonder if it's as prevalent as it used to be. But the concept of dominoes matching the edges of tiles to build a pattern is pretty ubiquitous. Now, King Domino starts with that, but then it tosses in a really interesting drafting mechanic on who gets to place which domino. And it is actually really brilliant. The, the turn system in King Domino is one of my favorites. And then you have a unique scoring system that's a little different that actually makes it an area control game. But those two combines are built on such a basic concept that I think this is a great gateway game. Now, one of the things that will happen is your first game, someone's probably going to be a little lost and score badly, but they're going to pick it up right away. And with how quick this game is, it's really easy to play two or three games in a row. Now, one of the things I do love about King Domino is that once you get people hooked on it, you can easily start adding in the expansion, specifically Queen Domino, which adds a lot more hobby game elements, like having an economy where you have to start earning money to buy for buildings and buildings that you can build into your empire and a little bit of engine building and even some take that with being able to send a dragon against someone else. To me, that is a perfect step into bigger meteor Euro games just by taking your basic King Domino and adding in the Queen Domino elements. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, King Domino is probably the absolute easiest one on this list to teach people. The game just makes sense. I mean, dominoes are one of those basic things that we learn yeah. as, as infants almost. Next, I have the most modern game on the list, something I couldn't have talked about in any previous episodes because it was just released this year, and that is Land vs. Sea from Good Games Publishing. Uh, for a full review, you can check out our last episode. We just reviewed this one. This is one of the easiest to learn tile laying games out there, taking under five minutes to teach. No, it's not quite so simple, but I would say it's even easier to teach than Carcassonne. Now, that's just the basic game. It is a really dead simple place a tile, place another tile, try to complete areas. If you're land, you're trying to complete land. If you're sea, you're trying to complete sea. That's basically it. There are optional scoring rules you can also add that make the game more complex. Now, the problem is. What I think is the gateway game is the basic game, the one that you could probably teach anyone. Any non-gamer is going to be able to pick up the basic game. The game only plays two players the basic rule. But once you get enough people who have played that, you can then group those people together and play in groups of three and four. I think this could be a great one to grow with your group as well because you can slowly introduce those new rules which include more hobby gaming concepts. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would uh, consider Land vs. Sea the next one up from King Domino. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still easy to teach, but you've got more complex shapes and you're developing more complex patterns for than King Domino. Yeah, one of the hard ones on Land vs. Sea is to get people to not pay attention to the, the clutter on the tiles. And at least in the basic game, you can just be like, ignore it all, yeah. except for these two symbols. Just Once you start throwing in the extra scoring, then it gets a little more difficult. One of the things that I think is great for public play events is thematic games, things that people are going to recognize based on properties they enjoy. So my next suggestion is Horrified Universal Monster. That theme alone, these are the classic black and white movie monsters of yore. That is going to catch people's attention. Now, what I love most about this game is how simple the actual rules are once you start playing. They're going to seem overwhelming to a, a new player because there's four different things I can do on my turn. How do I choose? But once you start playing, it all just makes sense. And I personally think for a new group of gamers, you're going to play with one monster. I don't even know what the rules say you can play with one monster. I know you can go down to two. Play with one monster. Sure, it's going to be dead, simple, and easy to win. But that's perfect when trying to hook people and for people just learning how to play more complicated games than they're used to. I'm sure your group will be up to three, four, maybe even five monsters in no time. Yeah, absolutely. This is probably the most advanced of the games on this list, but honestly, that's not saying much. No. Uh, it shares a lot of concepts with mass market games, and the topics and content are familiar to most folks, yes. uh, much more so than train routes or European cities. I agree. Finally, I have the most oddball game on the list, in my opinion. Quacks of Quedlinburg. Now, despite the fact that Quacks is very much a designer board game. It's Wolfgang Warsh. It's, it, it's in the hobby realm for sure. You're not going to find this one at Target. I find it's very approachable to new players as long as you teach it, making sure to tie the mechanics to the theme. Don't tell people 
oh, there's a catch-up mechanic where you add rat tails. That means nothing to a new gamer. Tell them that the players who are behind start to cheat by tossing in rat tails to thicken the broad. And they can get away with this because everyone's paying attention to the point leaders. That is going to get people like, oh, I get it. I'm be- I, you're busy looking at Sean who's got all the points. I'm going to slip in some rat tails and cheat, which rat tails make the game easier to win. It is a catch-up mechanic, but you don't have to describe it that way. The pusher luck and real-time elements of this game make it highly engaging. And I've got to admit, even not playing this game or you've already done for the round, watching other people agonize over whether they should pull more ingredients out of their bag or not is a ton of fun to watch. I have sat and watched people playing this game, no intention of trying it myself and had a great time. Now, the one thing you do have to worry about here, specifically because Phil's talking about a library game night, is this can get loud. This can get very loud. And while most libraries want you to keep things relatively quiet, Absolutely. You can promise to be quiet, but when you pull that snap berry and your pot bursts and suddenly you get a little loud, even yes. if it's just for a moment. So with these games, the, the, the three games Phil mentioned, the seven I just mentioned, that gets us to seven suggestions total, which I think is good for now. Because as I mentioned before, the concept of gateway games and games to hook gamers is a recurring topic on the show as it has been. So what I will do is I will provide links to not only where you can purchase these games, but I will also include links to all those previous shows and maybe some of our blog articles as well if you are looking for a more comprehensive list. All right, well, now let's uh, <clears throat> head over oh. to Lobby and see what games the lobbyists love. No, let's, let's see what suggestions wow. the lobbyists had for this topic. All right, lobbyists, what game suggestions do you have for Phil? And we've got some great uh, chat happening in there already. Thanks for joining Impacts, even if you can't stay long. Uh, Flashy is uh, the great, uh, you know, the first thing Pax has to say. Uh, something with great table presence, uh, Colt Express and Camel Up, which we already talked about. Yes, Camel are their Up, go-tos, we definitely talked uh, For making people go, what's that? Yeah, Cult Express is a, a programmed movement game where you're robbing a train that comes with a literal 3D train you are moving your playing pieces over. Um, I would think the new Fireball Island would probably be a fantastic game for this. Or the new Hero Quest, recently republished by Avalon Hill. Though those might be considered mass market, at least they were back in the day, they're definitely more on the hobby game side of things now. Um, something else I would recommend is pulling in licenses. If you know that people um, at the event are into certain licenses, you may want to try to find games of those licenses. Sean mentioned DC, Marvel. Those are two big ones. Uh, the Funkoverse games are use the you know silly looking Funko figures to do little bit battle games. We blew people's minds with that game at a Comic Con. Like they had no clue. Like uh, it's a game where you set up your figures and you're going to battle. Like there's different ways to play. You can play capture the flag or whatever. We were just doing a, a you know a, a what do you got? Just a beat em up, right? Last man standing. And we put it on the table. And the first thing the players always wanted to do was grab the dice to roll. Because that's how every game they play. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You have you have four action points. What do you want to do? Well, what are the dice for? Well, if you try to hit them, it's to see if you hit. And like for people who haven't been playing hobby games for years or Dungeons and Dragons or whatever, that just blew their minds. Fair enough. Uh, the next thing Pax has is uh another thing that many games people grew up with didn't have strong themes yeah now this isn't quite as uh true now with the some of the heavy theming of even monopoly that's getting out oh, there yes but uh it's you know what mo said about dead man's cabal it's intrigue with a theme or yes. we're space for spacefarers exploring new worlds or nomads in a post-apocalyptic world uh themes unlike you know rank boring monopoly no one really gets monopoly i mean yes everyone sort of understands that you're playing like a daddy warbucks kind of character but it doesn't feel immersive at all whereas modern board games definitely do no i totally agree theme is a great way to sell games that that especially to public people who don't know let's put it this way if you don't know hobby board gaming you're going to walk in and go, well, I don't know, that game's got a bunch of hexes on it. That's got this rid of stuff all over the place. There's some people stacking wooden sticks on a can. Like, like what is going on? Meanwhile, if they look over and go, oh, wait, that's Star Trek. 
that's definitely the Enterprise. That's a Klingon ship. What's this? And here I am teaching Star Trek Expeditions, a cooperative Star Trek game. Well, not a gateway game. The Star Trek theme is going to give people a lot of leeway and willingness to try a game that actually is a fairly complicated Rainier Nitzia game. But they wouldn't have touched it if it wasn't for that Star Trek theme. Absolutely. Uh, next up, she recommends Indigo, a nice alternative yes. to Suro. Honestly, yes. Yep. So that's and I, 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 I am not a Suro fan. I love Indigo. Love the it. only advantage Suro has over Indigo is I can set it up and walk away because it's that simple. And it plays like eight players, I think. It's a lot. It's, it's eight or ten. Whereas Indigo is limited to four players only. Indigo is fantastic. It uses hexes to build your path. And you're trying to get gems to come off the board. But like you only score you and who's like you have two gates you score on. And whenever you score, it goes to two people. So it's like you're trying to help someone without helping yourself. Indigo is fantastic. I strongly recommend Indigo. If you're a Suro fan, go get Indigo if you ever play with less than eight people. There we go. And uh, new new uh, 1000, our, our new uh, lobbyist, recommends Crane, Fractured Empire. Now, this is a new one. Just kickstarted this year. I think it only got into say, people's hands uh, in October of this year. Uh, or or thereabouts. Uh, I think it's really only available on uh, crunchygames.com. That's crunchy with a K. Uh, it's a self-published game, but it's a intricate, uh, it's a fantasy fantasy card game, deck builder sort, uh, but they've really spent a lot of money on the art and theme of mm-hmm. the game. Uh, and it, uh, it isn't heavily reviewed in Board Game Geek, but the people who have reviewed it are definitely into it. Nice. Yeah, there's some uh, well, beginner deck builders. There's a few out there, like Dominion. Dominion is the gateway to deck building for people who've never played a deck builder before. Yeah. It is great for showing off how that system works. Now, most hobby gamers are probably sick to heck of Dominion and would rather sit down and play Clank or something a little more advanced or Lost Ruins Arnak, which I'll be talking about a bit later. Dominion still stands as a, hey, check out this new concept. And I mean, they do have games like Sushi Go there. So yeah. something like Donuts for Donuts, right. um, or even just playing something as simple as Haggis. Um, you know, again, these card games are so easy and quick and fun to play and easy to teach. And again, cards are familiar. Yes. Everyone sat down and played a card game of some sort. So it's an easy one to get uh, get people involved. Yeah, with. I, almost, I almost put diamonds on my list, but I put it on like every other one of those post where i was trying to pick different games for this one so we're not just repeating ourselves diamonds is to cards like spades or hearts or clubs right it's no one had put out a diamonds game so someone sat down and decided to make a game with diamonds that actually plays up to six players so you don't get a lot of trick taking games with six players and it has a whole thing where there's these diamonds passing around and it's the person with the most diamonds who wins so diamonds is a strong recommendation because it plays with standard cards um one of the things we did not talk about at all is role-playing games you mentioned For the Queen in passing, but I think For the Queen is a fantastic game to have at an event like this. Something that's past the stick improv role playing with some structure added to it. So it's not just freeform. Rory Story Cubes is more of a freeform one that I think would also be great. And something like Dungeon Dragons Adventure Begins, though I didn't give that rave reviews, it's pure improv, just make stuff up aspect is great for non gamers who don't need the structured rules where you just. Roll a d20 and see what happens, even though whatever you describe doesn't matter. But getting people into that interaction and storytelling is fantastic. Absolutely. Uh, and then Mountain Papa mentions Space Base, one of our uh, recent favorites. That's a little you know tough what? one to introduce people to. It was, it was on my list at first, and I took it off because even hobby gamers have difficulty with the way charge cubes work and what some of those powers mean. What I would be really tempted to do is to make a public play copy of Space Base, where I hand a demo pick, version, yeah, yeah, like I hand pick which cards can come out into the market and remove some of the more complicated ones that are like get five charge cubes and swap swap your six with your seven, and also get two bucks and activate your card to the left, right? Like just take all those out, take out the you win card, take out the penalizes other player cards, and just keep in the basic. You get income, you get um whatever the three rules are, you get income, you get credits, or you get points. I mean, even the idea of income reset, you know, your, your, your credits resetting every time back to your income is, you know, there's some tough concepts in there for people who are used to Monopoly. Yes. I'd say it's close. Base base is definitely, 
That, that's a, again, they're going to have an event in January, February, March, maybe in March, after you've already brought a few hobby games out, you can slip that out. I think it's a great game. It's a great public play game. It's a great, with all the expansions, seven players, great high player count, keeps everyone engaged. But when I think new gamers, I literally think, again, people are used to roll and move, trivia, party games, drawing things like that. That's kind of the mindset of most, and cards, like play, playing cards. There we go. All right. Well, that's what we've got uh, from our lobby right now. Remember, if you've got a game or game night question for us, all you got to do is head to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email me at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. 